We are strongly committed to achieving the monetary policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. <clears throat> So against all odds, Dogecoin is the biggest winner in crypto this week. A little bit of background here. The digital currency started out as a joke in 2013. The founders called it a fun alternative to Bitcoin. It's now a top 10 cryptocurrency in the world with a market cap of about $40 billion. About half of that was added just in the past day. All right, today is Sunday, April 18th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the activities this upcoming week. Folks, we are in the biggest stock market bubble in history, and it gets crazier by the day to the point where is no denial anymore that this is an extreme dangerous mania fueled by irresponsible monetary policy from the Federal Reserve. And if this bubble continues to blow bigger and bigger and bigger, the eventual inevitable popping of the bubble and the crash that will follow will be of biblical proportions and will perhaps spill over to the broader economy, an economy that is severely wounded and only being propped up by artificial stimulation via pumping more and more liquidity into the system. And all of this mania resulting from the irresponsible monetary policy from the Federal Reserve is creating massive inflation. And now the next stage of this inflationary storm is wage inflation. And I have all the information for you in the headlines of the day segment. Inflation will eventually get out of hand despite the assurances the verbal assurances, by the way, with no backing whatsoever from the Federal Reserve that inflation will be transitory. And even if it is not transitory, they got the tools. The problem is that this inflation will get out of hand, forcing the Federal Reserve to taper and tighten monetary policy sooner than expected. And that will mark the end of the bull rally in the stock market that started over a decade ago. Mind you, this is the ideal scenario that the market bubble will eventually pop and cause a severe crash. But in this ideal scenario, quote unquote, the Federal Reserve is hoping that when the crash happens, we will have an economy healthy enough to be able to absorb the crash in the stock market. But the big question is, what if this bubble and this mania pops earlier than the Federal Reserve anticipates, and we see a tsunami of margin calls causing one of the biggest market crashes in history? in a time when the economy is not able to absorb such a crash. That will be the nightmare scenario, and that will happen due to the mad scientists, the unelected mad scientists at the Federal Reserve, who are in the midst of the quote-unquote greatest experiment in financial markets history. This week, we have received one of the biggest warning signals that the mania is getting out of control, and perhaps the eventual pop of the bubble could happen sooner than the Federal Reserve would like. And that warning signal is the insane rise of Dogecoin this week alone. A cryptocurrency that was created as a joke. It's being pumped and pushed higher by fraudsters the likes of Elon Musk on social media, leading a quote-unquote asset with no fundamentals, with no output whatsoever, to have an epic rise in value, matter of fact, surpassing over $50 billion in market cap that is bigger than Ford Motors that makes over $100 billion in revenue every year. This is the market environment that the Federal Reserve describes as quote-unquote market functioning. And of course, retail traders and investors, the zombies that they are, they will chase any shiny object, any scheme with the promise of a quick buck and get rich overnight. We will talk about that and a lot more during the various segments of this show. But for now, let's start by covering how the market closed on Friday. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 164.68 points. 
or a gain of 0.48%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 13.58 points or a gain of 0.10%. The S&P 500 also closing in the green by 15.05 points or a gain of 0.36%. What about the sector's performance on Friday? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal basic materials. Number two for the silver medal defensives and at number three for the bronze you utilities. Meanwhile, the only laggard on Friday was the energy sector closing decisively in the red. Let's contrast that with the performances for the week. Leading the pack and closing at number one, yet again capturing the gold medal for the week, materials. And at number two for the silver, utilities. And at number three for the bronze, healthcare. Now, every single sector of the market managed to close in the green this week. And the reason is, we've been in a low volume environment in the stock market for weeks now. And the reason is, we did have some port portfolio rebalancing and institutional accumulation of ETFs. In addition, we have earnings coming up and major decisions are not being made ahead of earnings. By major decisions, we mean selling. Nobody's incentivized to sell and book profits prior to earnings because this earnings season is being hyped up as one of the best earnings seasons in corporate history. And indeed, we saw impressive earnings from banks at least this week. And the expectations are that we will see more impressive earnings from the different companies across the market. The big question remains, have we already priced all the good news? Meaning that we will witness sell-offs as earnings being announced. Once again, we are in the calm before the storm period. In the calm period with low volume, the path of least resistance is higher. And therefore, you saw every single sector of the market yet again closing in the green. Moving on to futures. The picture from Friday's action. Crude oil with modest losses for both the WTI and Brent crude oil. What about softs? Lumber on a tear. Massive rally. No stop in sign. Now closing at about 1300 for the first time. Lumber prices remain one of the largest contributors to inflation expectations surging higher. What else? Gains for sugar. It was an impressive week for sugar futures. And I explained to you the technical breakout in sugar before it happened happened and I did indeed open contracts for sugar futures. On the other hand, we did see an underperformance from coffee, cotton, and coca futures. Meanwhile, OJ futures were muted for the day. What about metals? One of the major contributors of inflation expectations is the price of copper. On Friday, we saw a retreat for copper prices, but copper has been also on a tear. Now, bear in mind that we saw a retreat for the 10-year treasury yield. That, in turn, lifted Gold and silver prices higher. We saw an impressive performance for gold futures specifically this week. Friday was no exception. We saw gains for gold, silver, platinum, and palladium futures. What about meats? We're seeing a pullback across the board. Lean hogs, aka the new tech, down for Friday's session, even though lean hogs prices also been on a tear. Massive run higher since the beginning of the year. Likewise, losses for live and feeder cattle futures. What about grains? The gains in grains led by soybean oil and soybeans futures. The losses, on the other hand, led by rough rice futures. Meanwhile, we have canola, oats, wheat, corn, and soybean meal futures stable on Friday. Moving on. To the big casino, the options market, and here are the names leading the action on Friday. At number one, Apple, with about 1.4 million contracts, about 74% of those were calls. At number two, Tesla, with a little over 700,000 contracts, about 51% of those were calls. And at number three, Clover Health. This is one of the SPAC scams from uh, Shamath Predatoria. Of course, uh, Shamath already made his vig from this uh, scam. He already got richer. Meanwhile, we have a ton of bag holders in this name who are chasing the dream, chasing the lottery ticket. On Friday, somebody spilled the rumor that there is a high short interest in Clover. And that ignited the Wall Street bets crowd and the likes. 
you know, the Robin Hoodies and the zombies to chase this name higher. Meanwhile, we now know that this was false information because the short float in Clover Health is a lot lower than what was projected to the Wall Street Bets crowd, meaning it is yet another game being played by hedge funds and insiders, trying to ignite a rally, creating another pump and dump, and the victims per usual, the zombies chasing the mania. What kind of investor or trader are you if all of what you're looking for is, where is the next short squeeze wave that I can ride on like a parasite? Once again, this is not investing, it's not trading, and it's not even gambling. These are zombies high on meth, fueled by steamy cash and free money printed out of thin air. And they're just looking for the next score. You feed them the ticker on TikTok, another social media platform, and they will go on and stampede like a bunch of morons. And in this case, for Clover, we saw a massive surge of over 650,000 contracts exchanging hands on Friday. About 84% of those were called. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. We didn't have any notable unusual trades or any high amounts being bid on any given trade, meaning that options traders are being hesitant of making larger bids prior to earnings. That of course doesn't mean that we did not have interesting trades to examine. Let's start by the ticker WKHS. This is for Workhorse. The stock popped double digits on Friday on the heels of an upgrade from an analyst. But here we have somebody betting against the stock in calling for a reversal of that pop by buying the 12 puts expiration date April 30th with expectations that the name will drop over 9% by then they paid about 64 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about six hundred thousand dollars and what about the ticker lkq this is for lkq corporation and auto parts manufacturer and auto parts stocks are what i call bullet stocks that should be in every portfolio because we have a chip shortage we have an ev war in the auto industry meaning that prices of auto parts will increase rapidly for these auto parts manufacturers it is extremely easy to pass the extra input cost to auto manufacturers like General Motors and Ford, etc. I gave you the name Magna International, the ticker MGA, a few days ago. This name is also an auto parts provider for automakers, and the name has been rallying significantly the last few weeks. Here we have another name in LKQ that provides alternative automotive parts to manufacturers and suppliers. Now, if we have a shortage in supplies then automakers will have to resort to alternative suppliers and this is the bullish case for lkq and in this case somebody's making a bullish bet for more gains to come by buying the 50 calls expiration date june 18th with expectations that the name will climb over 12 percent by then they paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade bringing the total all the way to about 630 thousand dollars what about the trade for the tlt they're betting on a reversal here meaning lower bond prices and higher yields by buying the 132 puts expiration date april 30th with expectations that the tlt will drop over five percent by then they paid about 10 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about eighty seven thousand dollars and here is another trade that goes hand in hand with the trade for the tlt for the ticker triple Q's, the Nasdaq. If yields rally again, then perhaps the Nasdaq will hit the brakes. And therefore, they're buying the 314 puts expiration date, May 7th. With expectations that the Q's will drop over 8% by then. They paid about 87 cents a piece to enter this trade, which brought the total all the way to about $600,000. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker MRNA for Moderna? The name has been on a tear lately on the heels of pausing the the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which will pave the way for more orders for Moderna vaccine 
means if the Johnson & Johnson pause prolongs. But somebody's betting that the gains for Moderna came too high and too fast. Perhaps we will see a resumption of administering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And therefore, they're buying the 155 puts expiration date April 23rd with expectations that the name will drop over 9% by then. They paid about a buck and a half a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $900,000. Moving on to the headlines that shape the day, starting with macro news. You know, with all the money printing, the stimmies and the likes, the consumer is feeling emboldened and highly euphoric. How could they not when real estate values are surging higher? Stock prices are surging higher. Cryptocurrency prices are surging higher. Dogecoin prices are surging higher. Garbage prices are rising higher. Dog shit prices are rising higher. Leading consumer confidence to reach elevated levels and that consumer confidence is being translated into spending and splurging in the economy, leading to higher inflation. Consumer sentiment rises to a pandemic era high. The University of Michigan's preliminary consumer sentiment index rose 1.6 points to a reading of 86.5 in April. That is the highest reading in 13 months. Sentiment about current conditions rose to 97.2 from 93. Expectations index unchanged at 79.7. But here is the catch. Consumers expressed concern about inflation with the survey's one-year inflation expectations rising to 3.7%. That is the highest forecast in nearly a decade. It is up from 3.1 in March. The five-year inflation outlook was unchanged at 2.7 percent so the consumer is believing the federal reserve that inflation will be transitory and even if it is not transitory then we got the tools bro and by tools they mean tapering which means ending the party in the stock market but in the meantime the party goes on. The mania goes on and the bubble gets larger and larger by the day, threatening to become an even more dangerous pop. And here we have the Federal Reserve throwing more gas on the fire by buying bonds on steroids. Of course, they're saying that we're not doing Operation Twist. We are not manipulating the yield curve. But the facts say otherwise. The Fed's balance sheet grew by $84 billion in the past week alone, the most in a month, to a new high of $7.79 trillion. And you wonder why yields were down this week. Now understand that this is a zombified economy that is hooked on the cocaine. It is a cocaine-based economy. What is the cocaine? It is fiscal and monetary liquidity. Here is the monetary part. And of course, we know if inflation rises higher above expectations, surpassing all the forecasts that the Federal Reserve will have to resort to tightening monetary policy and stopping the flow of cocaine into the economy and especially the stock market. What do you think will happen to a stock market that is an addict for more and more hits of cocaine? What happens when the Federal Reserve cuts the cocaine, ends the party, and asking the market to stand on its own fundamentals. The stock market will crash because all of the pumping the last few years has been going on not based on fundamentals, but based on the generosity of monetary policy. Meaning that we will see one of the biggest reversions to the mean in the history of the market. And for all of you who are saying that this means yields will continue to decline because the Federal Reserve is buying more and more bonds. What you're leaving out is that the government is issuing more and more bonds on steroids. They need the Federal Reserve to continue to print and buy those bonds to keep this economy afloat. Once again, it is a zombified economy, recovering, quote unquote, recovering, not based on fundamentals, for example, organic jobs creation, corporate revenues and profits being translated into capital expenditures. That is not the case. The economy is quote-unquote recovering because we are flooding the system with a tsunami of liquidity, free cash printed out of thin air. Now, what are the consequences of doing this practice? Number one, exploding the national debt. But hey, who cares about the national debt anymore? So what is the other consequence? The other consequence is creating inflation and inflation will get out of hand, perhaps causing a market crash that could spill over 
into the broader economy. Number three, devaluing the US dollar. Because the more debt you rack and the wider budget deficits you open, that will leave no choice but to devalue the US dollar. But devaluing the US dollar will come with other consequences, the likes of surging commodity prices in particular copper and oil. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, the folks at the Federal Reserve are a bunch of mad scientists cooking this uh, quote-unquote greatest experiment in financial history. They will not suffer the consequences. The Fed chairman himself is about 70 years old. He's not going to be here when the shit hits the fan, but the next generation will inherit this problem. Let's uh, circle back and talk about yields, treasury yields, because this week we saw a significant drop in treasury yields. And you saw that quote-unquote experts and the Fed apologists over at CNBC and the likes creaming their pants saying oh you see there is no inflation and inflation is going to be transitory yields are dropping lower because they're saying that inflation expectations have been tampered that is not the case every single data we received throughout the week and before that pointing to higher and higher inflation. So perhaps there is another reason for yields dropping lower beside the bullshit argument from the Fed apologists who are saying that yields are dropping due to tampering inflation expectations. But perhaps there is another reason. For example, short covering. I know I got a lot of messages on Thursday saying that, oh, you see, yields are dropping lower, there is no inflation, and the NASDAQ to the moon, bro. All the main names are gonna go higher. You don't understand, yada, yada, yada. What you are forgetting, sweetie, is the following. We just saw the longest sell-off in bonds since 1962, signaling a regime change in the bonds market. This is, by the way, according to the bond king himself, Jeffrey Gunlock, that the 40 plus years downward trajectory of yields is reversing and yields more than doubled since the beginning of the year but for these morons they get one day where yields drop six percent and by the way quickly reversed and gained three percent the following day they've already creamed their pants and came up to the conclusion the yields have topped and uh, the nasdaq will start surging to the moon bro and uh, technology and the mainly names now have the skies open and of course, these kind of traders are sitting all day with a big jar of Vaseline, looking at the charting program, tick by tick and jerking off. Please have at least a three month horizon in your calls and predictions. Otherwise, the market will eat you alive because inflation is not going anywhere. Matter of fact, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter by the day. You know, you have all of these brilliant economists and investors who in the past predicted accurately many bubbles and made bets against them resulting in profits in the millions and sometimes billions of dollars in this case here it is regarding the housing market real estate investor who shorted subprime mortgages says this housing boom is in a bubble too but hey what does he know this amateur right we we the robin hoodies and the zombies we know that we should trust Papa Jerome and he says that this is not a bubble. Where is inflation? Billionaire Jeff Green made a fortune betting against the housing market over a decade ago before it crashed. He told CNBC on Friday he believes the hot housing market is in a bubble once again. How long would it last? It depends. How long do you keep the faucet open and this money running? Meaning that he is saying once the Fed tapers, and by the way, the market is not going to wait for the Fed to taper. The market will look forward and if it sees tapering sooner than expected it will crash ahead of time i know that papa jerome is telling you that i got your back come back to the casino put your blindfold on and gamble because i will let you know in advance if we are heading into tapering or raising interest rates i will let you know in advance or oh, how generous you are Papa Jerome, because it sounds too good to be true, right? You think Papa Jerome will let you know in advance? Or will he let his Wall Street buddies know in advance? And his Wall Street buddies will make the move ahead of time, crashing the market, booking their profits, and leaving you and I exposed with our pants down. And here we have The Economist sounding the alarm, saying the Fed should explain how it will respond to rising inflation because their quote-unquote average inflation targeting regime remains too vague 
Remember, the Federal Reserve says that we are eyeing a 2% inflation on average, meaning that they will let inflation rise a little harder to achieve that 2% average. However, the Federal Reserve says that we are not binded by any formula, meaning we're not using a formula that guide us on how to average inflation to 2%. Instead, we will eyeball inflation, and you guys just have to stop being alarmists and uh, scream and yell and just trust the process, right? Trust the process. Just like with uh, Shamath uh, Spakaria, trust the process, bro, until you lose everything. Meanwhile, he gets away with millions and millions of dollars. And by the way, a lot of you have accused me of being uh, too much of an alarmist when it comes to inflation. Asking me, hey, where is inflation? Is it here? Is it there? Where is inflation? There is no inflation. Perhaps I am seeing inflation more than you do because I live in Southern California, specifically in San Diego. And San Diego is experiencing the highest inflation in the nation. Just a little teaser of what's about to come to your neck of the woods. San Diego's inflation rate outpaces much of the nation from March 2020 to March 2021. Prices increased 4.1% in San Diego metropolitan area, said the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, CPLI. This outpaces the nationwide average of 2.6% in most metro areas studied by the Bureau. The Bureau released data from 12 metro areas Tuesday. The only metro area to have faster increase at 4.9% was Tampa. So Tampa first, then San Diego, then Riverside with 3.6%, then we have Dallas, 3.4%. Here is the price inflation for various necessities for households in San Diego. Food costs. The prices for food were up 4.8%. That includes meat, poultry, fish, eggs, bakery products, and alcoholic beverages. What about housing? Housing prices up 1.8%. What about apparel? Apparel costs up 3.6%. Gasoline prices up 14%. 0.2%. Once again, up 14.2% year over year. What about energy prices? What about other energy prices? For example, your electricity and gas bill. Well, that is up 11.8% year over year. Then we have medical care up 3.8%. We have prices for used vehicles up 8.7%. Meanwhile, the prices for new vehicles up 5.7%. What about tuition, school fees, child care? Here comes the deflationary forces, bro. Child care and tuition fees were actually up only 1%, which is below the 2% rate of inflation. Maybe because we're staying at home and we're homeschooling our kids. But once we go back out and about, we will need child care once again. The prices will surge higher. And you know, the Fed's apologists on YouTube and the financial news media continue to deny inflation, saying, where is inflation? Is it here? Is it there? Where is inflation? And they will continue to deny inflation along with the Federal Reserve until and unless, wait for it, inflation hits your wages. God forbid your wages start to go higher. <laughs> Now we're going to end the party. No more. Inflation is getting out of control. Look at all these wages going higher. Well, you know what? We are already there. Labor, not lumber, will drive inflation. As supply catches up to the demand, higher prices for commodities will probably subside. You know, because we can just uh, chop the forest and make more lumber. Or, or we can use a magic wand to create more copper. Perhaps we can create a digital copper and sell that as an NFT. Perhaps that will subside commodity inflation. But anyways, they're arguing that wage inflation is the one we have to watch out for because there is a shortage of labor. I know you might be scratching your head right now saying, wait a minute, why do we have a shortage of labor when the unemployment rate remains historically elevated? Perhaps uh, this is the reason all the stimmies and printing money out of thin air and dropping it all over the place from the helicopter created lack of incentives for people to work. Why do I need to find a job when I am cashing government checks and gambling on Robin Hood and doing doing only fans and I'm making more money than what I would make working a job and that is leading employers to offer more and more incentives aka higher wages aka wage inflation show me the money baby if you can swing a hammer you can go make 25 bucks an hour 
The Simple Economics 101 answer to what a company should do when it has trouble recruiting enough workers is to pay them more. That is the logic that underprints the economic policy of the Biden administration and the Federal Reserve. Achieving a tight labor market will result in higher pay for workers. And here comes the wage inflation. This is perhaps one of the reasons, specifically for the restaurant industry, which faces a particular challenge. The sectors that have thrived during the pandemic have been on hiring binges, often paying higher wages than restaurants do. Amazon alone added half a million employees in 2020 with a wage floor of 15 bucks an hour. Companies like Walmart, Target, Home Depot and grocery chains have all been hiring aggressively with wages at or not far behind those levels. Meaning that when mom and pop's restaurants open for business after the quote unquote reopening, meaning lifting lockdown restrictions and lifting the mask mandate. When that happens, restaurants will have to charge you more. And the reason is they have to attract employees who have many other choices right now. They have to pay them a minimum of 15 bucks an hour. That will translate in your restaurant bill. You will be paying more to dine out. For now, the consumer can absorb this rise because their savings rate is high. They continue to receive stimulus and payments from the government. Their real estate holdings and stocks portfolios are surging higher. So the consumer feels emboldened to go out and spend more, never mind the increase in cost. The question is what happens after that because once you hack wages higher you cannot just cut them down because the consumer is not showing up meaning that inflation will indeed persist and stay with us longer even after the initial splurging spree from the consumer that is actually taking place as of right now as we speaking based on the artificial stimulation of the economy via stimulus and fake money. What will that lead to? It will lead to stag inflation. It's not a far-fetched outcome. And now we have American households expecting more inflation in the near horizon. Americans now expect the price of gas to rise at 10% apace and the price of rent to rise at 9.3% apace. Far more than rents have been rising so far. So regardless of what you hear from the Fed's propagandists, American households are actually expecting more inflation to come. But what about our leaders in the federal government and the Federal Reserve? Are they concerned at all? Of course not. Here is the Biden administration. A month-long effort to monitor and model economic trends inside the White House and the Treasury Department found little risk of prices spiraling upward faster than the Fed can manage. Just uh, trust the process, bro. And here is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, whose job is to worry about inflation, is not worried. We do expect that inflation will move up over the course of the year, said Fed Chair Jay Powell in congressional testimony last month. Our best view is that the effect of of inflation will be neither particularly large nor persistent. And the question is, what assurances do you have for us, Mr. Powell? Of course, he has none. Just put your blindfold on and continue to gamble. And here we have the new Fed governor, Christopher Waller. And he said that he expects the U.S. economy to grow 6.5% this year and the unemployment rate to drop to the lows of 5%. Meaning, he's saying we ordered economic growth and economic recovery, but we told them to hold inflation. You know, like when you order a sandwich and you say, hold the mayo, no mayo in the sandwich. We ordered economic recovery for over 6% in a year, massive spending, and a recovery in unemployment, but somehow that's not going to result in inflation. Okay, moving on to market sentiment news and what else? The biggest bubble in the history of the stock market, the biggest mania in the history of financial markets. It has now reached comical levels. And here is an example. A tiny New Jersey deli, that is by the way a sandwich shop, carries a market cap of more than a hundred million dollars despite totaling 35,748 bucks in sales in the last two years combined. But hey, uh, market's functioning, right Jerome Powell? This is uh, price stability. And here's from the Wall Street Journal. The bull case for $100 million New Jersey deli. And the reason behind this uh, obscene valuation for a deli shop in New Jersey is the fact that the company is listed in the stock market. We know that the zombies, the Robin Hoodies, the maniacs, 
will stampede to buy any lottery ticket. I'm telling you, we should start selling horse manure and list it in the stock market. All we have to say is uh, we discovered a new research that says uh, horse manure will uh, substitute lithium in future EV batteries. Boom. To the moon, bro. The wallets of the zombies will be wide open. But you don't have to imagine the horse shit scenario because this is already happening. Buy dog shit sold in the form of crypto. We're talking about Dogecoin with powerful social media influencers like Elon Musk cheerleading an already rabid Doge fan base and Reddit boards lighting up with pro Doge propaganda. The tongue in cheek coin's market value had swelled to more than 52 billion dollars on friday this puts the dot-com bubble to shame this is the most insane mania ever people know that this is a joke and this will crash it has absolutely no value but because the donkeys we follow online in social media you know the cut leaders the quote-unquote influencers are hyping this up then we're gonna stampede like a bunch of morons looking for a lottery ticket and then when we lose our money we start crying saying that the market is rigged shorts are doing whatever yada yada and of course uh, cult leaders who've been pushing this scam the likes of the fraudster of the century reverend elon musk have no shame if he was a man of his own word he would accept dogecoin as a form of payment for his tesla cars of course he wouldn't do that his job is just to pump and when the dump happens and people start losing their money all of a sudden reverend elon would say oh i was just memeing and joking i wasn't giving financial advice and the mania reached extreme levels on friday pushing dogecoin to the moon and at the same time crashing robin hood and the maniacs are urging each other to diamond hands this one too and not to sell until all of them are millionaires which will not happen because the backstabbing has already started what do i mean by that the early end Entrance in this scam, in this pyramid scheme, have made an insane amount of money out of dog shit, out of nothing. And they will pull the trigger, take their profits, crashing the scam on the little heads of the morons who joined late. And this is exactly what a pyramid scheme looks like. And here we have uh, Mia Khalifa. Who? Is that what you said? Who? What are you, an owl? You know exactly who. And by the way, close that nasty tab you're watching right now. I'm playing my voice in the background. It's very insulting. And uh, Mia is saying, good morning, let's get Doge to $1 today. That did not happen, but we'll see. And of course, this is how the new generation of investors, they keep touting them as the smartest generation, get their investments advice from. Social media influencers, cult leaders, porn stars, homeless people in the street, doesn't matter. Give me tickers. Give me a name that will double tomorrow, right? When you guys ask me why is the viewership for this channel remains low, the answer is because we are producing a program for adults, you know. And this is not what's on demand right now. The zombies are looking for give us stickers, give us videos that say these two stocks are gonna double, these three stocks to the moon. And of course, uh, Mia Khalifa says, I'm not a financial advisor, but you know what? I trust Mia Khalifa even if she's not a financial advisor. You know why? Because she knows all about doggy positioning but it's not just porn stars and celebrities pumping dogecoin we also have a former sane human being current whack job mark cuban who went all in on bitcoin and now he is pumping dogecoin saying that valuations don't matter fundamentals don't matter whether it is scam or not doesn't matter it's all about supply and demand what the irrational price of dogecoin says about crypto investors it says that they're not actually investors or traders or even gamblers they're zombies high on meth looking for the next score we even have people tattooing the laser beam meme on their eyes for now they look like laser beams but after bitcoin crashes they will look like blood of tears but rest assured you're not alone if you are a retail trader maniac chasing the tulip mania of the 21st century you're not alone even the quote-unquote institutionals are with you specifically tesla witch professional gambler kathy wood because she's down about 20 percent now on her purchases of coinbase but she's not giving up she added another 64 million dollars worth of coinbase shares and she dumped about a hundred million dollars worth of tesla shares once again chasing the shiny object 
the new shiny object. Is this investing or is this gambling? And of course, uh, Bitcoin has a bright future ahead of it. At least this is what the crypto maniacs and the culties keep telling me. Bitcoin is the future, bro. How is it the future when it's already banned in China, India, and now Turkey? What is it going to be the future in... Uh, Jupiter and of course they're gonna come after the 21st century's tulip mania from the green angle based on the electricity sources its miners are using Bitcoin is possibly the least environmentally friendly asset in the world, according to Bank of America. A single Bitcoin purchase worth $50,000 has a carbon footprint of 270 tons. Wow. By the way, these are the confused culties because they follow the cult of Tesla and Elon Musk saying that Elon Musk is saving the environment and we are greenies and we love the climate or yada yada yada. At the same time, they're the same people in the Bitcoin cult, the least environmentally friendly asset in the world. What does that tell you? It tells you that the culties have no principles at all. They are a bunch of confused zombies looking for an identity and they found it in following Reverend Elon Musk. And this insane mania, this historic bubble going on in the market right now, extreme irrationality. It's due to the insane monetary policy of flooding the system with unneeded cash to the point where trading and investing in stocks has now become the new form of of entertainment people are gambling win or lose regardless because investing and trading has become a ha 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 funny meme funny joke form of entertainment congratulations mr powell i hope your uh, quote-unquote market is still functioning and what about the nft mania anybody if you remember paris hilton if you don't here is a refresher And Paris Hilton is now exploiting and milking the NFT mania, saying that she is obsessed and it is empowering to female and women artists. And it's the future, yada, yada, yada. So how do you get into NFTs? Here is Paris Hilton's answer. Well, I've always aimed to be an innovator. So last year I was approached to do an NFT for a good cause. So I immediately said yes. Cryptograph said it was doing a charity initiative that could basically draw whatever I wanted on an iPad. And I chose to draw my, my okay. I think I'm losing some brain cells reading this garbage. So let's move on. We also have uh, Edward Snowden, former NSA employee and whistleblower, also exploiting the NFT craze, the NFT mania. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest and most insane bubble in stock market history. As if we did not have any recent examples of pumps and dumps, booms and busts. I'm not asking to go all the way back to 2008 or even the doc com bubble this last year a name like nicola we saw the pump and dump in this name investors chasing the mania and a lot of them ended up holding the bag what about spacs the recent boom and bust of spacs and this took place this year a few weeks ago we don't have to look back years and years in the past to know that what we're doing right now in dogecoin and all of this garbage will end up the same way that nicola ended you don't have to go all the way to the dot com bubble to know that just as shamath peloton tortilla was the face of the spac frenzy that gripped financial markets at the start of the year he is today the face of the bust the bust that happened in spacs will follow through to the entire stock market because here it is the most irrational insane mania in stock market history when we break down the s p 500's book value you know this uh, massive run higher the bullish run that is so healthy quote unquote this is what i hear from the geniuses on cnbc healthy bull rally really because the intangible book value per share is now double the amount of tangible book value per share so the rise of the s p 500 is happening on the back of intangible value intangible assets wow and lastly in market sentiment news what about the radix bull to bear ratio reading at all time highs the most bullish sentiment ever surpassing the crash of 08 and the dark 
calm bubble highs. Not even close. What happens in an insane bubble mania in the stock market? Investors lose their money and the only beneficiary is Wall Street banks. They're cashing all of that money you're losing on options gambling and buying plug power and Palantir and all of that garbage. JP Morgan's soaring investment banking fees boosted profits to 14.3 billion, the most the century's old firm has ever earned in a single quarter. Goldman Sachs revenue and earnings both set records in a quarter of Reddit fueled stock market mania. So all of you who message me and say, yeah, we know that the market is crazy and the crash is coming, but FOMO, bro, FOMO. I don't want to miss out on plug power. I don't want to miss out on doge. Here is another way you can exploit the mania and benefit without assuming the irrational, stupid moron risk. You can buy names like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. We heard from their results this week and how impressive the growth that they have experienced from this stock market mania. Moving on to the heat map analysis. Once again, we have a low volume week, yet another one. This time around, the action was accompanied by a significant move in the bonds market. We saw yields dropping, taking a decisive move lower. Therefore, it is a no-brainer that utilities managed to outperform this week because when yields drop lower, utilities, technology, and growth managed to shine. We saw a move in technology higher, but not as high as I would have anticipated knowing ahead of time that yields will drop 6% in a single day. Yes, you saw gains in mania names like Tesla, but you also saw losses in names like Palantir, Neo, Solar names. These are the names that are supposed to outperform when we see yields dropping lower. Therefore, the action is telling us that the move lower in yields was not due to a projection that the trajectory of yields are expected to be lower, but perhaps due to technical and short covering reasons. Because if the trajectory of yields were to be lower, then one would expect that technology will outperform significantly. Meanwhile, severe losses in banks and the inflationary trade of industrials, materials, defensives, this is not what we saw from the action this week. Matter of fact, the inflationary trade also managed to outperform. For example, take a look at the performance of Freeport McMoran, representing copper, a massive week for FCX. And when it comes to to banks, some of the names were affected due to earnings, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, but we also saw a significant outperformance from Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is still lagging JP Morgan, Bank of America. So in the pristine results we received from banks this quarter, Wells Fargo has more room to go versus JP Morgan and Bank of America assuming that the outperformance will continue. But the question once again is, if yields dropped lower this week based on tampered inflation expectations, then why didn't the inflationary trade crash this week? Why didn't we see Freeport McMoran down 10%? Why didn't we see industrials and financials also down 5, 6, 7% apiece? The action tells me that the inflation story is not over yet and the bonds market will reflect that in higher yields which is the long term trajectory. What about the different themes of the market? The reopening trade, mixed performance with no definitive conclusion from these performances. What about the inflationary trade? Overall, outperforming, the majority of names closing in the green. But did we see definitive inflationary theme this week? The performance was mixed and we did not see massive gains across the board for the inflationary names. What about the disinflationary names? Once again, a mixed picture. But when it comes to the mania names, the high valuation names, the performances were definitive, meaning we saw massive gains in these names. NVIDIA over 10%, Okta with gains over 10%, Tesla almost 10%, DocuSign almost 9%, DoorDash over 6%. These are definitive performances meaning that there was a theme of the deinflationary trade specifically rewarding the high multiple names due to the decline of treasury yields. The sustainability of these gains will depend on the trajectory of yields. If you believe that yields will rise higher again, then these gains are not sustainable. If you do believe, for whatever reason, that yields have lower readings to go, then these names will continue 
to outperform. Moving on to the technical analysis, starting with a 30 minutes chart of the SPY, the S&P 500. Can we extract any valuable information from this particular chart? Not really. We are in a breakout, opening gaps overnight on very low volume. Check out the volume histogram. The volume for this run higher was a lot lower than average. And we usually see in these pumps higher overnight on lower volume and these types of rallies last for one two even three weeks but then they are corrected with a massive flush down with higher volume so we are anticipating a pullback here for the s p 500 in the market in general that could happen either due to the rise of treasury yields or corporate earnings perhaps the valuations and stock prices are overpricing corporate earnings and if we do see a pullback how far down can we go the answer is it could happen all the way to the level of 400 and that will be a steep pullback and the recovery from the pullback will depend on retail traders picking up the move and buying the dip what about the s p 500 futures a daily chart we have diverged higher from the trend you see the trend of higher lows you rally a little bit for a week or two then you have a small mini correction and then you rally again for a week or two and then you have another correction and this is a healthy bullish trend what's not healthy is when you diverge higher impulsively higher from the trend it is usually called the last hurrah rally signaling the end of the bullish run when did we see this last how about we go all the way back to last year the rally that started in the summer and ended in september here once again you have a defined trend of higher lows rallying for a week or two pulling back and then rallying again pulling back and then by august the end of august we started to see an impulsive rally higher diverging from the trend and at the time i called it the last hurrah rally and indeed it was because it was followed by a large correction in september so we are expecting the same outcome here we are in the last hurrah leg of the rally and we should be expecting a correction soon and what about the cues what's going on here 30 minutes chart all markets are looking similar this is looking identical to the spice chart we have an impulsive breakout higher opening gaps on the way and the reversal will happen in two ways in my opinion a massive gap lower overnight from which the market fails to recover or the preferred scenario of a gap and crap move gapping higher in the morning only to close in the red losing all of the gains by the closing bell moving on to the daily chart of the Q's futures the nasdaq futures this is a daily perspective once again we are in a breakout we do have a slight negative divergence in the rsi it is not significant yet but if we do pull back we have 13,900. that will be the first support and then we can go all the way down to 13,599 which will coincide with the purple trend line doesn't need to happen right away we could have a few days of breaking higher in the nasdaq when you compare the nasdaq with the s p 500 the s p 500 looks more exhausted than the nasdaq what about the iwm 30 minutes perspective once again this is one of the most important charts to watch in the market we had the bull flag formation we had a failed breakout i'm highlighting those in yellow we had another failed breakout we are now consolidating below that candle forming a bear flag we saw the bull flag formation attempting to play out not once but twice and failing in both times forming a bear flag formation so from this micro perspective of 30 minutes the chart is struggling and it is prime for a pullback what about the daily picture of the rut the russell 2000 and this is the chart to watch for small caps because we don't have a conclusive closing this week i gave you the number of 2264 i told you that the rut has to close above this number to remove any bearish formation from the chart we closed at 2262 so we are not making a big deal out of this one we have to watch for the negative divergence in the rsi we have to watch for the crossing in the MACD indicator. Which way it will be, green or red? Because this chart kept us on suspense for two weeks now, not making a definitive move one way or the other. For now, the bears have the advantage, but it is getting very 
very close between the bears and the bulls for the Russell 2000. The Russell depends on the reopening names. If they outperform, then the Russell will outperform. It also depends on GameStop. GameStop happens to have a huge weighting in the Russell 2000. And if we see massive moves up or down in GameStop, then that will indeed have an impact on the Russell 2000. What about the dollar, the Dixie? What's going on here? The Dixie getting very close here. Either it's going to bounce higher now or never because because we cannot break the series of higher lows and higher highs. And if the Dixie starts trading lower, then the inevitable destination will be 91. Therefore, breaking the bullish trend the dollar started since the beginning of this year. So this will be an important week for the US dollar. What about gold? This week will be also important for gold as well. Because gold finally closed over the very important level of 1,750. For now, the tailwinds are intact for gold, assuming that the US dollar and treasury yields will continue to decline. A massive rebound in either the US dollar or treasury yields will put a stop to the bounce in gold. And what about Bitcoin? Tulip mania, what's going on here? The chart, from a technical perspective, remains intact. The trend remains bullish. Last time we took a look at this chart, I told you it looks like one of the most bullish charts in the market right now. However, the technical analysis is one thing. The fundamental analysis and the psychology also plays a role. And therefore, if you're just depending on technical analysis in your trading while ignoring the news and psychology could result in big mistakes. Bitcoin has a competitor now in Dogecoin. Even if Bitcoin rallies all the way to $100,000, that's a gain of a little over 50%. Meanwhile, Dogecoin is doubling every day. Some of the money in Bitcoin will be taken out to buy positions in Doge. And therefore, you saw that massive breakdown candle in Bitcoin. It didn't manage to break the bullish trend yet, but it is a warning signal that this rally in Bitcoin is extremely fragile. What about yields? The other very important chart to watch. Because here we have a break in the bullish trend. The series of higher highs and higher lows. We made a lower high and a lower low. In a very sharp move in the form of an ABC pattern, which is usually a short term bottoming formation. And you are starting to see a bull flag formation in yields, suggesting that the bounce might not be over yet. But once again, the bullish trend has been broken. So even if the bull flag plays out and we see yields trending higher again, the ultimate test will be the resistance of about 1.620 basis points. Closing above that will confirm that this was a short-term pullback in yields and now the bullish course has been restored. Absent of that, meaning a pullback before reaching 1.620 basis points or reaching there getting rejected and reversing lower, that will open the door for the 10-year treasury yield to fall all the way back to 1.5%. What about the TLT, bond prices? Closing above 139, my threshold, meaning that the move higher in the TLT is perhaps not over. To confirm that the bounce, the run higher, whatever you want to call it, in the TLT is over, which by the way will coincide with yields shooting higher, restoring and resuming the bullish rally. That level is 134 and a half. If the TLT closes below that level, then we have a confirmation that we are about to see another surge higher in yields with high velocity, which will disrupt the market. So 134 and a half is an important level to watch. But what about the VIX? What's going on here? No protection needed whatsoever. We're going all in. Earnings season without protection. But somebody's buying protection, at least I did, buying puts in the stocks that I own and buying more VIX futures. Because right now, buying puts is extremely cheap. The VIX is down significantly and the premiums are down. So this is an excellent time to buy insurance on the names that you own in your portfolio, just in case if earnings season disappoints. And of course, I am expecting an impulsive move higher in the VIX to close the gap at around 19 and a half. Moving on to Apple. Apple has been leading the Nasdaq higher almost single-handedly. We saw a massive, very impressive couple of weeks in Apple. The problem is looking at the chart, you are starting to see consolidation, meaning that the bulk of the gains, the majority of the action from this leg higher have been already realized. And now the chart is plateauing and it is becoming susceptible to be pulled back by the center of gravity, which happens to be the level of 131. 
What about Tesla? The souffle? What's going on here? Nothing is going on. Impressive week for Tesla closing above 720. And that keeps the bullish run on the table. Now we have the resistance that happens to be in the gap of 781.30. We are pretty much at the support of 720. That has been already tested and proven as good support at least for one day. And the bullish run higher in Tesla, the rebound, whatever you want to call it, is still intact until and unless we close below 679 from a daily perspective so for now for the short-term perspective the bulls have the advantage in tesla's chart but i do expect the name to pull back a little bit and remain stable all the way till earnings we have earnings coming up soon for tesla not this week but the week after so we're not going to see major moves one way or the other because if we do it will be due to insider information being leaked from these earnings good or bad moving on to the conclusion of this video we don't have significant events this week in the economic calendar on friday we have the manufacturing ism and some housing data on thursday in addition to the weekly jobless claims but that's about it for this week the focus will be on earnings so what earnings are we looking forward to on Monday, we have Coca-Cola, United, and IBM. Tuesday, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, in addition to Netflix. Wednesday, we have Verizon, Chipotle, and Lamb Research. Thursday, we have Union Pacific and Intel. Friday, American Express and Honeywell. So this will be an important introduction to earnings season because banks have their own thing. But now we will see the reaction from these stocks that have been running higher and higher since the elections. Will earnings justify the runs higher or not? It is judgment day for these names. Lastly, remember this. The market is extremely fragile to a pullback, a crash, because we are in an insane mania bubble fueled by debt and levered positions. The margin ratio is at all time highs. So the risk for an accident, a disaster could happen out of the blue. The Federal Reserve doesn't want that to happen at all because the broader economy cannot absorb a market crash right now. In my opinion, this bubble was due to be popped back in September and we saw a massive pullback, a massive break in the trend, only to be followed by the rescue operation. The rescue operation of overnight pumping, leaving all of these gaps higher with extreme low volume, which happens to coincide with passive inflow into the market. This year, we also saw another breakdown of the market and the market was due to crash. We got another rescue operation in the same fashion, gapping higher overnight, extreme low volume, masked with portfolio rebalancing and passive inflows. Folks, they cannot afford to crash this market, not right now at least. However, at the end of the day, this is a game of Tetris. Finding gaps to fill, today we're moving to the reopening trade, tomorrow to the technology trade, big cap technology, the day after the inflationary trade, value stocks, back and forth, back and forth, to buy extra time. But when you don't have fundamentals backing up all of these valuations, it is just a matter of time. Before you bloat every corner of this market, you reach the top of the screen and game over.